The University of KwaZulu-Natal's College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science is committed to making a difference in our world, from the classroom and laboratory to the field. It provides one of the finest study and research environments on the African continent and is recognized internationally as a center of excellence. Agriculture, Engineering and Science is one of four colleges that make up the University of KwaZulu-Natal and is home to over 8,700 students and approximately 700 staff. Three of the university's five campuses form the core of agriculture, engineering and science activities in the region. The college comprises five schools, Agricultural Earth and Environmental Sciences, Engineering, Chemistry and Physics, Life Sciences and Mathematics, Statistics and Computer Science. Engineering is offered on the Howard College campus, Agriculture on the Peter Maritzburg and all the other sciences on both the Peter Maritzburg and Westfield campuses. Exceptions are Agricultural Engineering, which is offered in Peter Maritzburg, and Geology, which is offered at Westville only. To compete with the best and to meet the challenges of the 21st century, South Africa needs highly skilled professionals in the areas of Agriculture, Engineering and Science. We offer a wide array of interesting and innovative degree programs that open doors to a variety of different careers. Some degrees are unique to UKZN and are not offered at other tertiary institutions. For example, we are the only university in South Africa to offer a fully accredited agricultural engineering degree and one of only two universities in the country to offer a BSc in land surveying. Our postgraduate food security training program is the only one in the world and we have the widest range of agricultural disciplines at any single South African or African campus. The choices of degree and the options on offer may seem confusing at first. Engineering degrees are more specific and the options are usually career focused. Emphasis is placed on training in the specific principles which engineers deal with in their professions. Engineering offers seven different professional specializations. There are also degrees in land surveying or geomatics and property development. In science there are structured or career focused degrees. These include fields as varied as chemical technology, marine biology, industrial and applied biotechnology, and computer science and information technology, to mention a few. There are also more general degrees with a lot of flexibility. In this case, students have the choice of studying a BSc M stream in maths, physics, computer science, and statistics. All of these have a strong mathematical component. The other option is a BSc LES stream with a focus on the life and environmental sciences with subjects such as geography, genetics, botany, hydrology, zoology, ecology and microbiology. In agriculture, there are various different options that involve practical and scientific applications. Students can combine science subjects with specific agricultural disciplines for a four-year Bachelor of Science in Agriculture degree. These are more career orientated. Agriculture and Agricultural Management are three-year degrees with a higher practical component. Dietetics is a professional qualification that deals with the role nutrition plays in the promotion of health and the treatment of disease. Most degree programs across the college have field trips and projects that contribute significantly to the curriculum. 
This ensures that students learn in real-life situations under full field conditions. Many of our lecturers have received excellence in teaching awards, are recognized internationally and are rich in practical experience. Students have access to excellent facilities that rank amongst the best in the world. 300 million rands has recently been invested in new teaching and research facilities, state-of-the-art laboratories and improved equipment. The 30 million rands new School of Engineering building is the envy of engineering campuses across the country. Agricultural students have access to a 356 hectare research and training farm situated near the Peter Marisburg campus. This facility provides students with hands-on training and is used extensively as an outdoor laboratory for teaching and research in areas such as animal and poultry science, horticultural science and agricultural engineering. Adjoining Ukulinga is the Bisley Valley Nature Reserve which supports a diversity of plant and bird species as well as some large mammals. It provides a rich learning and research environment for staff and students. Based on the Westville campus, the college possesses unique facilities for research into higher voltage power transmission. These facilities are available in only three other places in the world and form part of the Eskom-sponsored Science and Technology Innovation Park. The Science and Technology Education Centre showcases the college's scientific achievements and promotes the public understanding of science, engineering and technology within the region. The college houses a wide range of sophisticated equipment in its microscopy and microanalysis units, staffed by highly qualified and skilled technical specialists. The College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science prides itself on its graduates who are highly sought after. In a market characterized by a shortage of qualified professionals in science and technology, our graduates are readily employed around the world in the fields of agriculture, science, commerce, industry, engineering and research, to name just a few. Research plays a major role within the college and operates at the cutting edge of technology. College has the highest research output in the university and produces the most research publications. There are over 60 well-established research groups and centers within the college. The African Center for Crop Improvement caters for students from all over Africa. It is one of only two African plant breeding programs on the continent. Based in the School of Agricultural, Earth and Environmental Sciences, the African Center for Food Security focuses on alleviating hunger in Africa. It offers food security training programs, undertakes academic and applied research, and provides policy and program support. Promoting sustainable engineering practice is the Center for Research in Environmental, Coastal and Hydrological Engineering, or CRESH. It deals with the interaction between engineering and the natural environment. The Mechatronics and Robotics Research Group in the School of Engineering provides an excellent research and education environment for its senior undergraduate and postgraduate students. Judged one of the best research centers at the university, the Center for Plant Growth and Development focuses on high quality research in the plant-based disciplines of plant physiology, plant molecular biology and ethnobotany. The Center for Quantum Technology deals with physical phenomena at the microscopic level. Quantum physics led to the development of the transistor and the laser and is currently being used to develop quantum computers and quantum cryptography. The college is committed to access and readdressing the disadvantages and inequities of the past. The highly successful UNITE engineering program 
and the Science Access Foundation and augmented programs offer alternative access to university, equipping students from disadvantaged backgrounds with the skills and knowledge to pursue their degrees of choice. Both these programs contribute significantly to advancing black African scientists and engineers in South Africa. Staff and students contribute to a number of outreach and community initiatives that focus on social responsibility, sustainable development and upliftment of the wider community. The college also engages in activities involving the pursuit and understanding of science, engineering and technology through exhibitions, festivals and roadshows that target high school learners and the general public. The college has minimum entry requirements for its programs. These differ from degree to degree, but all require a national senior certificate and minimum performance levels in mathematics and either physical or life or agricultural sciences. For those who do not meet the minimum requirements, access programs are available. Additional information and brochures can be obtained from the contact information accompanying this video. The College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science is proud of its contribution to the university, the region and the country. UK Redden is one of the best. I definitely understand it's one of the best in South Africa. So for me, um, there was no other institute that I would have preferred other than UKZ. We have the best facilities here in terms of laboratories, in terms of equipment, in terms of human resources, in terms of literature. UKZ is one of the best universities universities in the country that uh, teach agriculture and natural sciences. What I think is good about this college is the level of international collaboration that we have. We have friendships with universities all over the world, which means that we're keeping up to a great international standard. UKZN has got much more facilities and it's recommended worldwide to do your science studies here. Life begins here. Yes. We continually strive to be academically excellent, innovative, in research and critically engaged with society. We invite you to join us or work with us to be part of this exciting team. Hi Ashwin, can I go ahead? Yeah, you can go ahead, Dr. Professor. Okay, thank you. Right, good afternoon, uh, students. I hope you had a good break. We're back to uh, learning ways. Welcome to UKZN Matric Helpline. Uh, just some important tips before we start off is, uh, you know, when you want to, to um, try and answer some of the questions. The most important thing is for you to understand the different sections that are being taught to you. So it's always important to basically look at the uh, notes. You can use notes that you have from your class, uh, your class teacher, your physics teacher that may have given you notes, but also you may supplement them from the UKZN uh, helpline website that we've been putting up notes. And you can also contact, uh, there's a, a website called siavula.com and they have the e-textbooks. So that will also help you with quite a lot of uh, uh, information. So you can access literature, which means you can access uh, all your notes and you can also access some of the, uh, the questions, the tutorial questions. Right, so also it's important to, to to give attention equally to all your subjects and not just cram, you know, not cram your work. Um, so it's important for you to have a, a, a good idea of a timetable and uh, sections 
So for example, in chemistry, what I suggest is you write down the topics of all the, so for example, if you're doing organic chemistry, like we're gonna do today, then what you need to do is under organic chemistry, we're going to do, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna look at nomenclature. That means naming of organic compounds. Then we're going to look at alkanes. Then we're gonna look at alkenes, and then we're gonna look at alkynes. Then under alke alkanes, for example, you, you look at reactions and, and so forth, okay, stereochemistry. So write down those, those, those subtopics and then get the notes and then look at some of the, the questions that are based on them and then look at some of the uh, past year papers on or how, you know, what type of questions are being set as far as uh, the sections are concerned. Okay, um, today I'm going to... I'm gonna go over some nice organic chemistry and, and share some, some um, good organic chemistry knowledge with you, right? Uh, I've quoted the textbook or I've cited the textbook that I've, I've accessed some of the notes. So I've uh, referenced the, the textbook that I've used and I'm gonna start with organic chemistry and basically what it, you know, what it is it all about. Sometimes um, when you're going through these sections, it's not only about learning the, the theory and what you taught and going to write an exam, but it's when you start a career, when you come to university and, and finish a degree in chemistry, what are you going to do with organic chemistry? And what does this organic chemistry teach me? And where can I, you know, what can I do with it? Where can I get a job with it? Uh, and so forth and so forth. So organic chemistry, as you all know, is based on the element carbon, right? So um, you obviously, here we were talking about carbon that's attached to hydrogen. So if you have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, then you have what we refer to as an organic uh, compound. But generally, or a, a general uh, um, property of uh, organic compounds, organic solvents, um, is simply uh, a compound that's insoluble in water, right? So if you look at uh, an organic component like benzene, right? Benzene is insoluble in water. Octane is insoluble in water. So, so you find that many organic components are water insoluble, right? Now, I'm just going to sort of uh, skim through the theory on carbon and why it forms bonds and, and so forth. So you know that we say carbon is the center of organic chemistry because you have carbon at the center and you've always got four bonds around the carbon. So the simplest organic molecule is methane, CH4. So whenever you look at a, 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 an organic compound or an organic you know, a chemical compound, the carbon will always have four bonds um, around it, okay? It may not be saturated. That means they're not be single bonds. In some case, you may get a double bond and that's what we refer to as an alkene. So you're familiar with an alkane which is a saturated carbon, an alkene, which is an unsaturated, that means a carbon has got a, a double bond with another carbon, okay? So you can see the electronic configuration. You all know that carbon is a 1s2, 2, 2s2, and a 2p2. So that means it's group four. So you can see uh, if we take the second principle quantum number two, and you can see it's basically um, has four valence electrons so it belongs to group four, right? So the group number will tell you how many valence electrons are available for bonding. So nitrogen, phosphorus, they've got five electrons av available for bonding, right? And uh, oxygen will have six, so it's group six, et cetera, et cetera. The halogens, uh, you know, uh, uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, they have seven because they belong to group seven. So a characteristic property of carbon is that it is able to form multiple bonds, right? Now, generally, as I said to you, they form four bonds, right? Carbon forms four bonds. But when we say multiple bonds, meaning more than one. <clears throat> and obviously, you've seen in many um, organic uh, compounds or you know, organic uh, formulae, you'll find that you have double bonds and you have triple bonds. So carbon can also bond with itself, right? So... We have something called the valence bond theory. And simply the valence bond theory means that those electrons that are available in the valence shell that are available for bonding. So you can read this valence bond theory on your own. I'm not going to go too much 
into that because it's simply uh, it's it's very straightforward in terms of understanding. Now, for for um, for hydrogen to so if you look at the electronic configuration of hydrogen, right, you can see it's a one s two, two s two, and a two p two. So in the p orbital, so if I'm going to go back, so can you see it's a one s two, right? 2s2 and a 2p2. So you can see in this two in the p orbital, you've got one electron and another single electron occupying the orbital. Now, an orbital is basically the mathematical function, right, of an electron around a nucleus. So it's not this box where we put in uh, an electron. It's basically an imaginable um, arrangement of an electron around the nucleus in a three-dimensional space. So the problem uh, that you've got two unpaired electrons, as you can see here. So two unpaired electrons, which meaning, if we look at the ground state electronic configuration of carbon, it tells us that, hey, carbon can only form two bonds because you can see the two electrons in the 2s orbital are, are already paired. That means we can, we got two electrons here that can be paired. But what happens that, you can see one electron from the S gets promoted into one of the P, right? <coughs> and then it mixes. So the 2S mixes with the three 2P orbitals and we get four sp3 hybridized molecules, right? So you'll see in this little table, it says for an sp3, we got four sigma bonds. That means now after the electrons from the 2S moves into this vacant orbital you can see here right on page one then we take one electron from the 2s and we put it right at the end here so you can see now then we mix it so then we have four uh, of of equal energy that means all four the 2s and each one of the 2p are equal in energy so we refer to them there's a word we use it's called degenerate right we use we, we refer to it as being a degenerate um uh, orbital. Right, so that's why it says here sp3, there's four sigma bonds because now you can see carbon can form four bonds, right? So hybridization is simply when an electron moves and that's by heating. So if you take a carbon compound, we heat it at high temperature and then it promotes an electron from the 2s orbital into the 2p, right? Into the vacant 2p, as you can see here. And then you mix them up and you will form four sp3. That means the 1s is mixing with three p orbitals. That's why we call it four sp3 hybridized state, right? Now that means you can form four single bonds, right? And that's what hybridization means. So when we look at organic chemistry, there's different ways in which we represent the formulae. So if you look at n-butane, right, butane, uh, let me just go uh, one down. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. So you can see in this particular table, the number of carbon atoms, right? So you can see that this is a saturated alkane, meaning that there's no double bonds. So as we, if, if you have one carbon attached to four hydrogens, it's methane. And you know methane is a gas. You've come across methane. If you have number of carbon atoms two, C2, then you will have six hydrogens attached. That means a carbon will be bonded to a carbon and then each carbon at the end will have three hydrogens attached on, on each side. So the formula becomes C2H6 and the name of the compound is ethane. So you'll see as we're going down, we have meth, eth, pro, but, pent, hex, hept, oct, non, dec, undec and dodec so when you have prop you know pro uh, pro right propane it's three but is four pent is five hex is six hept is seven oct as you know is eight and you know octane is our petrol that we put in our car and you know how expensive petrol is these days non nonane right non is nine deck is ten undeck is eleven and dodec is twelve so you can see we, we, refer, we, we refer to this as the nomenclature. And as the number of carbon atoms increase, so there's a general formula we can use. And I'm sure you've come across this formula. CnH2n plus 2, right? You know that if you have C1, then H will be 
2 times 1 is 2 plus 2 is 4. So it'll be C H4. If N is equal to 2, then you've got H will be 2 times 2 is 4 and 4 plus 2 is 6. So it becomes C2 H6. And here we're seeing it here. Can you see that? So the general formula is C N H2 N plus 2. So if you had C3 H8 and I'm, and I'm uh, using the general formula, so there's three carbons, then you got two times three, six plus two is eight. So the formula for propane uh, will be C3H8, okay? So you can use that formula very, very, very easily. So I'm gonna go up again and I'm just gonna show you uh, what we refer to as the empirical formula. The empirical formula, which means it's the simplest whole number ratios in which this particular uh, compound can exist. Now, the molecular formula is in which the actual molecule exists, right? So you can see here, we can get one molecule of C4H10, right? But it's empirical formula. That means the simplest way in which we can have this formula is we divided it by two, and you can see you have C2H5. But in nature, one molecule of C4H10 will exist. Then we have the structural formula. So we just put the CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, right? So remember, each carbon is attached to each carbon first, and then you fill in the hydrogens. And here's the 2D structure that I'm showing you here. Now, the Lewis dot structure shows you the four carbons. And can you see on the end, it's got one, two, three, and, and the, the right and the left uh, ends, one, two, three, and then CH2, CH2. Can you see that? So the first CH3 refers to the three H's at the left-hand side, the CH2 on the next two hydrogens attached, and the right-hand CH3 shows you the three hydrogens. Now the two dots in each case is showing you the single bond between a carbon and a hydrogen. So for your purposes, you are used to the structural formula that we write CH3, CH2, CH3. And sometimes you may ask to write the structural formula where you write out the exact structure like this. And you can see each carbon has got four bonds around it, right? They may not have the same number of hydrogens, but they've got four bonds. So you can see the, the first one uh, has got three hydrogens attached to it and it has a carbon. So it has four bonds. The second carbon has actually got uh, uh, two hydrogens attached to it. And then it's got two carbons attached to it. Okay, then we have what we call a 3D structure. The 3D structure basically shows you, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's actual three-dimensional space uh, um, that you have, right? So, and then there's other, other uh, representations of the saw, sawhorse projection and the Newman projection. But the line, you can see, if you count the, 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 first, the first part of the line has got a carbon, that's one. Then you'll see the first kink, that's two. The second kink is three and the end is four. So this is the line structure of C2, right? So, uh, sorry, C4H, that's one, three, six, eight, ten, 10, right? So it's going to be C4H10. So you can see the line structure of the C4H10, right? So this is, this line at the bottom has got four carbons. The first carbon, I'm pointing the cursor to it. The first kink is the second carbon. The third kink is the third carbon. Sorry, the second kink is the third carbon. At the end, you can see another carbon. So the molecular formula of that is uh, C4H10. And you've got three hydrogens uh, on each end and CH2 in between. Okay? So you can see all the different ways in which we can show the chemical formula of these different compounds. Now we're going to look at uh, the functional groups. You've got to know exactly what these functional groups are. So that when you are, are doing any reaction, then you understand how reactive some of these um, functional groups are and what you can do with functional groups. So for example, if you have just a saturated uh, uh, compound with carbon to hydrogen and carbon to carbon bonds, like you saw here, right? If you look at the structure, the, the 2D structure of, of uh, butane, right? Um, 
sorry, yeah, of, of butane, that's this here, you can see that it's basically a saturated compound between just carbon and hydrogens, okay? So if you look at this alkane, right, you can see it's a C286, right? So it's a, a, an ethane, right? It's ethane. And basically you can see that it's a saturated compound. That means each carbon has four single bonds attached to it. There's no double bond. Then if you have a, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so they, right. So if you look at alkane, so what is an alkane? Uh, sorry, that's alkane. So whenever you have an alkane, you will always think about a structure like this 2D structure. That means it's only got single bonds. There's no double bonds, right? But if you have an alkene, you can see now one carbon has a has a, a, a single uh, has a double bond attached to another carbon, right? So this means that it is unsaturated. But if all the bonds have a, a single bond around it, it means it's saturated. But if you don't have all the bonds that are that are being substituted, we refer to it as being a, 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 an unsaturated compound. Alkenes and alkynes are generally unsaturated compounds. So you can see an, a, an, a molecule like ethene, right? So what we've done here is, so if you have a, a, a ethene, right, which is two, okay, we've basically now, if you look at this ethene structure, you've got a carbon attached to another carbon and two hydrogens. So you've got one hydrogen, two hydrogen, three hydrogen, four hydrogens, and you've got a double bond in between. Can you see the double bond in between? So you can see we move from the name from ethane to ethene. So the ene tells you it's an alkene. The ene tells you it's an alkane. So that's where ene, ene, and then the word, the, the, the terminology ion, so ethine, can you see? We've taken away one hydrogen from et alkene, uh, the ethene, we've taken away another hydrogen from the ethene, and now you've got a triple bond between the two uh, um, carbon atoms, right? And you've only got one hydrogen on each side. So this becomes ethine. So when you have a carbon triple bond, right? We call them alkynes, and this one becomes ethine. If it's a double bond, they refer to as alkenes. And here we have an ethene molecule. I'll talk a little bit more about the nomenclature as we're going along. Then we have something called an, a halide. And as you can see, as soon as you remove one of the hydrogens right, from your saturated, so just say, for example, you removed one of the hydrogens from here and you basically put in an X, right? So you put in an X. Okay, then this X now stands for either fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. And you can see now you've put in a halogen. So this is referred to as an alkyl halide, right? An Rx. So the X, so this is the R group, the CH3, and the X is basically the halogen, right? And in this case, you can see it's chloromethane because you only got one carbon and you've got a chloro attached to it. So it is known as chloromethane, right? So I've shown you an alkane, which is a saturated compound. That means only got single bonds of carbon to hydrogen. Then you've got alkenes, which is a carbon double bond carbon, right? Then you've got an alkyne where you have a carbon triple bond carbon, right? So that's referred to as alkynes. Then I showed you the alkyl halide where you put in, you replace one of the hydrogens with a halogen and that becomes a halide, alkyl halide, because you've got an alkyl group and you've got a halide attached to it. And there's the example, chloromethane. Then if we, if we remove one of the hydrogens from a saturated compound and you put an OH, then we refer to it as oral, right? It becomes an alcohol. 
So instead of putting a fluorochlorobromoiodo, we put OH, right? And the OH is referred to as an alcohol functionality. So you can see in this case, we have methanol, CH3OH, right? And you know that methanol is extremely poisonous. If you, um, if you ingest any methanol, uh, then uh, you, you can end up uh, in quite a serious trouble. Um, so people are encouraged not to, to uh, add methanol to their drinks or drink methanol for that matter. It, uh, it is um, a very poisonous uh, material. Okay. So now you can see how we, we started off with uh, uh, CH2, CH2. Your alkene had a CH3, CH3. We removed one hydrogen, one hydrogen, and it formed a double bond that became an ene. Then we removed another hydrogen and another hydrogen. Then we've got an alkyne, right? Then if you took CH3, CH, uh, um, if you took uh, an organic component like uh, a CH3, X, right? So in this case, you can see you have CH3Cl, which is a halide. So you form an alkyl halide, right? And so this is a chloromethane, right? A chloromethane. Now, um, here it says none, which means um, we don't have any sort of uh, uh, specific nomenclature for halides, except that we call them alkyl halides, or we refer to those uh, compounds as halides, okay? Then you saw the alcohol. Then if we simply take one alkyl group, connect it with an oxygen and put another alkyl group on the other side, then this is what we refer to as ether. You must have heard of anesthetic ether, right? And here's a formula of dimethyl ether. You can see one methyl, there's another methyl. And when we have two of them, we use the prefix di. So it's a dimethyl. And because we got the ROR group, can you see the ROR group, right? We refer to it as a ether, okay? Then see what happens now when we go to an aldehyde. So basically, you have your alkyl group, then you have a C double bond O and an H. There's the H. So whenever you have a C double bond O and an H, we refer to as an aldehyde. And in this case, you can see it's one, two, and it we use the word al, A-L, ethanol. So in this case, ethanol is an aldehyde. So the term al tells you that it's an aldehyde. Then the next functional group, right? So what I can tell you is that from LK, alkenes going down, the only stubborn uh, group of uh, uh, function, uh, the, 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 the only group um, of organic components that are stubborn and are, are not very reactive are the alkanes, right? You've got to treat it under very specialized conditions, uh, high heat for you to basically uh, get them to uh, function. Okay, so, or to react rather, not to yeah, well, function or to react. So alkanes are, are, are not very reactive. So you've got to treat them especially, you know, under high temperatures and add a catalyst and so forth. Alkenes are reactive, alkynes are reactive, alkyl halides. So anything from alkene going down, these are all reactive components. Okay, they are all reactive components. So I've showed you the eta, I've showed you the aldehyde, then I've showed you the ketone where you got R, a C double bond O, and an R. So you can see here you have proper, proper known, proper known prop coming from the three carbons. There's one, two, three. And because it's a, a ketone, you can see whenever you have one R group and another R group on either side of the, of the carboxylic acid group, then we refer to it as a ketone. Okay, so these are functional groups that you have to learn. You've got to know what they have in them. And then you've got to learn the reactivities because many of them might be quite reactive and many of them may not, okay? And another, another functional group that we get is a carboxylic acid, a carboxylic acid. 
So you saw with, with the eta above, it simply had CH3C double bond O, CH3. Now we simply removed one of these CH3s and added an OH. And this is ethanoic acid, right? So it's ethanoic acid in terms of, right. Right, so the next group we have of functional groups are called esters, right? So you can see, <coughs> how did we go? We went from, so we started with, an, with, a, with, a, with a saturated compound, CH3, CH3. We took away one hydrogen, we got the alkene. We took away another two hydrogens, we got the alkyne. Then we took away the, the, the H plus and we put a halogen. Then we put an OH. Then you put an OCH3. Then we put a C double bond H. Then we put a C double bond OCH3. Then we put a C double bond OH. So the, the, can you see the carboxylic group is staying in the center? And what we're doing, we're changing the substituent on the right-hand side. So in this case, we got ethanoic acid, and this is a carboxylic acid. You've got to learn these functional groups. Then can you see, here's the CH3. There's the C double bond O. And if you put, instead of an H, see the previous one was OH. So we removed this H. And what we did, we put a CH3. So this becomes what we refer to as an ester. Now, esters are used in shampoos, by the way, right? To give you that foamy uh, uh, feeling. So methyl, ethanoate, methyl, meaning there's a methyl group attached to it. And ethanoate, you start numbering from the carbon that has the carboxylic acid group. So the carbon under the C double bond oxygen will be carbon one. And the next on the left, the CH3 will be carbon two. Okay. But because the molecule, the parent compound is uh, uh, an ester, its parent name must end in O8. Like here, if it's a carboxylic acid, it ends up with the, the term oic. So you can see this is ethanoic acid. And if it's a ketone, it has the word own. So you can see propanone. If it's an aldehyde, it goes as al, right? Ethanol. You see that? Ether, dimethyl ether. And obviously, the alcohols are known as alls, okay? As functional groups. So you can see quite a lot of uh, um, functional groups. Uh, to learn, but they're quite straightforward and they're quite easy to understand. These, uh, there's also, uh, I showed you esters, and then you have what we call amides. So now you got your CH3C double bond O, you take out this OCH3 and put it in H2, and that becomes an amide. Then if you remove the C double bond O and the NH2 and simply just join an NH2 to the R group, that becomes what we refer to as an, a, an amine. Uh, I'm not too sure. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Because somebody said I must share my document. Can you raise your hand if you're seeing my screen? Can you give me the thumbs up if you, if you are seeing my screen? Okay, thanks. So I'm not too sure. Right, okay. So everybody's seeing my screen. Then P Y in Kosi Shabalala. Why why are you saying share the document? I'm not too sure why you're saying share the document. Are you seeing are you seeing the document? What do you mean when you say can you please share the document? Meaning you couldn't see it. You might want us to share the PDF. Oh, okay. Okay. So I thought I, he wasn't being able to see it on the screen. Okay, so our next uh, functional group, and you have to know these functional groups because these are the groups that I will go through some of the reactions and you'll understand the reactions of these groups, okay? So you can see now you've got your CH3C double bond O and earlier on, can you see we had OH? Now we just added a CH3. Instead of an OH, we got OCH3. And that is an ester. They use it in shampoos, as I told you. Then we have ethanamide. Okay, so you can see 
CH3, C double bond O. So we took out the OCH3 now and we just put an amide, NH2, right? These are used in polymers. They're used in polymers to make paints, to make plastics, etc. right? Then we took out the C double bond O and the NH2 and just put the NH2. So can you see, whenever you see the word ide, ide, right? There will be a C double bond O. When you see amine, right? Methyl amine, that means there's no C double bond O. Get it? I'll repeat that. Whenever you see a C double bond O, NH2, it becomes an ide, amide, right? But if it doesn't have the C double bond O and simply has a carbon attached to a nitrogen, then we refer to it as an amine. So in this case, you can see methyl amine, right? It's showing the NH2 group. The NH2 substituent is referred to as an amine group, or sometimes they refer to it as an amido group, okay? So especially when it um, attacks onto a, a uh, a carbonyl carbon like this here. So it becomes an amide, right? And then you can see you have a carbon to triple bond nitrogen. And this is a special case. It's called acetonitrile. Now we use acetonitrile quite often in our labs as a solvent, right? And acetonitrile is also used to make polyester resins and stuff like that. So you can see uh, quite a lot of uh, applications. Right now, what A means, I just want to draw your attention to this, to the side. Look at amides. Can you see amides? When the a primary amide is when you have one carbon, right, attached. Okay, you can see it's attached directly to that first carbon, right? Now, if you look at a secondary amide, right, you can look at the secondary amide, you can see that the nitrogen that's attached to one carbon, right, is also attached. Is So the nitrogen is attached to one carbon and you can see there's a bond. So it's also attached to another carbon, okay? So in the tertiary amide, you can see the nitrogen is attached to the one carbon and then it's got two other bonds. Can you see the two bonds? So when nitrogen is attached to three bonds, it's tertiary. When it's attached to two other bonds, it's secondary. And when it's just attached to one bond, it's a primary, right? Can you see that carbon to nitrogen is a primary, carbon to a nitrogen, right? And then you have a, a nitrogen to another bond here. Can you see that bond here, right? I'm not talking about the bond to the H, but I'm talking about bond to another, another organic compound, right? So it's secondary amide. And then here you'll have a tertiary amide because it's attached to a carbon and it can be attached to two other carbons in the tertiary amide, okay? The same with the primary amine. You can see primary amine, the nitrogen is attached only to one carbon. Secondary amine, you can see the nitrogen is attached to one carbon. It's attached to another carbon here, right? So we're not showing that carbon, but it's there attached to a carbon known as a secondary amine. And you can see the tertiary amine, so the nitrogen is attached to one carbon, on the right, another carbon, and below it, another carbon. So three carbons, and we refer to it as a tertiary amine, okay? So nitriles are simply a carbon attached to a triple bond nitrogen, right? So you can see the nomenclatures are important. You've got to go through the structures and know them because in your questions, a lot of your answers and a lot of the correct answers uh, depends on whether you understand what the structure is all about, right? And if you can understand the, 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 the structure of the functional groups, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So let's move on. So I showed you the, um, I showed you the, um, the different functional groups. I showed you the structures. So now we're going to try and name these compounds, organic compounds, right? So you know now we're going to have uh, some hydrocarbons that may have an OH on it. So if you know there's an OH on it, there we are, that it's going to end up with a word with all, you know, butanol, methanol, uh, uh, hexanol, et cetera, et cetera. 
So the IUPAC rules for naming compounds is the parent hydrocarbon is the longest continuous chain containing the highest priority, right? The functional groups, right? And I'll come to that, uh, pri the functional priority uh, just now. Then it says the chain is numbered in the direction that gives the highest priority functional group the lowest possible number, right? The highest priority functional group, right? Now, don't worry too much about that for now, but I'll explain to that what the highest priority functional group. It means that certain functional groups are prioritized over others, okay? So rule one says the parent hydrocarbon is the longest continuous uh, chain, right? So, so if you have the, the that, that's what I'll show you an example as well. The chain is numbered in the direction. The chain is numbered in the direction that gives the highest priority functional group the lowest possible number. Okay. So the chain is numbered in the direction, and I'll show you an example where the highest priority functional group has got the smallest number in terms of the uh, naming. If there is a functional group and a substituent, the functional group gets the lowest possible number, right? If the same number of functional group is, is ob obtained in both directions, the chain is numbered in the direction that gives a substituent the lowest possible number, okay? If there's more than one substituent, the substituents are cited in alphabetical order, okay? So, <coughs> excuse me, alpha will come first. Uh, uh, or, or if you've got like a chloro, if you have a chloro group versus an amido, right? So you can see A from amido comes before C in chloro, okay? So that's what they mean. Um, if there's more than one substituents, the substituents are cited in alphabetical order, right? So let's look at uh, a prefix, right? So side chains having the ending IL, right? So, so if you have a side chain, right, then your, your, if you have an alkane, then that group becomes like an alkyl, right? The ending must have something alkyl, you know, uh, and I'll show you uh, what I mean when I say that, right? So side chains having the ending IL. Right, so uh, Mishle, can you please? Okay, I'll mute you. That's fine. Right, so now hydrocar hydrocarbon branches. So that's what we're saying here. As soon as you put on a side branch, right? So you can see if you have a CH3 coming from the word methane, it now becomes a methyl substituent. If you're putting on seeds, say for example, this was CH3, CH3, then you know it's going to be um, ethane, but it's missing one hydrogen. So as a substituent, we refer to this as the ethyl group, the ethyl group. Then if you have one, two, three, it becomes a propyl group, a propyl substituent, and so forth. And then here you can see butyl, one, two, three, four. So it's a butyl group. And here, so remember, I'm not saying butane, I'm saying butyl, because the one hydrogen has been taken off. And here, pentyl, that's one, two, three, four, five. So you can see it's a pentyl group. So it's very important for you to know these functional groups and understand them so they make uh, perfect sense to you in terms of the uh, nomenclature, right? In terms of the nomenclature. Right, then we have other specialist group. Don't be too, uh, don't be too worried about this, but I'm just sharing this with you because you may come across some special names. So this, for example, is what we call an isopropyl. But if you look at it, it's not very difficult to understand. It's got one, two, three carbons. 
And the three carbons, if you look at it, you've got hydrogen surrounding all the carbons, okay? But this, this substituent is given a special name. It's referred to as isopropyl, isopropyl, okay? The next is sec butyl. We go to tertiary butyl, can you see? So the carbon is attached to four bonds, but one is missing. So it's T or tert butyl. Then there's isobutyl, isopentyl, neopentyl, and tert pentyl, which is a, a liquid, right? So it's 545, and I'm going to give you a, maybe a five, five to eight minute break. So I would say we'll get back in about 10 minutes, and then I'm going to start with the rules for naming your compounds containing functional groups. Okay, so let's take a short break so you can gather your thoughts and some questions and then we'll start naming and I'm gonna show you exactly how to name these compounds, right?
Okay, so I'm back and let's get uh, move on with naming of these compounds. So you saw what we, we, we understand now what an organic compound is. I've shown you the different uh, types of molecules. You have uh, from carbon one to carbon 12, we looked at all the different uh, naming of, of methane, ethane, propane. We call that the homologous series. And now I've shown you all these different functional groups, right? So now let's see how we name uh, organic compounds because you'll have to name them first. And then after that, we'll go through some of the chemical uh, reactions and how they react. So you first have a prefix. It identifies, so the names of most organic compounds has three parts. We call it the prefix, the parent, and the suffix, right? So the prefix identifies where and what uh, for, uh, you know, identifies the, star, the substituents, basically. The parent is the backbone of the molecule. So if you have six carbons, it's going to be hex, you know, a hexane kind of molecule. And the suffix, this is particularly important as it describes the functional group. So if you have hex, in, then it tells you that it's an alkene, right? So for example, if you have a, a, a 2 comma 2 dimethyl hexene, so the prefix is a 2 comma 2 dimethyl, it tells you what identifies the where and what of the substitu substituents. The parent tells you uh, how long the molecule is, and the suffix tells you what functional group it has, right? So let's have a look at there's some rules. So here's, you can see a, a molecule, uh, an organic uh, molecule here, right? So it says, some compounds might contain more than one functional group, and thus a priority list is required. So for example, in this here, you can see the, the parent is uh, one, two, three, four, we've got five carbons, right? So it means that the parent compound is gonna be a pent, right? Five carbons. But look at it now. You've got a carboxylic acid group. Can you see C double bond OH is a carboxylic acid group on the right-hand side? And on the left-hand side, we have an OH group. So do I name it as, so do I na start naming, um, numbering the carbon from the left-hand side as in one, two, three, four, and the carbon number five sits under the C double bond O, or do I start off numbering from the right-hand side and go on to one, two, three, four, five, and this OH on the left-hand side is sitting next to carbon five, right? So do I number left to right or right to left? So the, this is what we're saying that the parent hydrocarbon chain is the longest continuous carbon chain containing the highest priority functional group. So here, can you see we've got a rule? So the highest priority group is if you have an alkane, but if you have an alkene, an alkene takes precedent over an alkane. So if you have an alkyne, amine, so here's an alcohol, right? So if we have an alcohol and if you have a carboxylic acid, so the priority of a carboxylic acid is higher than an alcohol. That means this particular compound is going to be called some oic acid, right? like a carboxylic acid. So in this case, it's going to be a carboxylic acid, right? And the chain is numbered in the direction that... Can you please mute yourself upon entry into the, into the section, into the uh, lecture? Right, so the chain is numbered in the direction that gives the highest priority functional group the lowest possible number. So in this particular example, you can see I'll start numbering from the carboxylic acid group. 
So the carbon sitting under the C double bond O will be carbon one. I've highlighted that, that'll be carbon one. So we're starting from the right-hand side. So that means we're going one, two, we're going left, one, two, three, four, five. That means you're going to have five hydroxy carboxylic acid, okay? So in this case, it's gonna be five hydroxy, but because it's one, it's five, it's going to be a five hydroxy pentanoic acid, right? So when it's five, so you can see the prefix, let me go to my, my prefix is five hydroxy, right? The parent is pent, one, two, three, four, five. And the suffix, it's a carboxylic acid. So it's five hydroxy pentanoic acid. So this particular compound is now labeled as 5-hydroxy pentanoic acid. So that's what we mean when we say that the functional groups have a higher priority than other functional groups. But if you had, instead of, say for example, if you had a C double bond NH2, then also you can see the amide has a higher priority over the alcohol, okay? An alkyl substituent, obviously you can see here has the lowest priority. Halides are always named as substituents on the hydrocarbon. So whenever you see halides uh, and substituents like these, they, they do not take on the parent compound, right? So here as an example, you can see these are aldehydes, that's a carboxylic acid, right? So when numbering the chains, which include these functional groups, start at the carbon attached to the hetero atom. So for example, here, you can see I've labeled it one, starting next to the carboxylic acid. That's what I told you in the previous example. So this is butanoic acid. There's no substituents, right? And can you see, we started next to the aldehyde. C double bond H is an aldehyde. See there, C double bond OH is an aldehyde. And this, because it's got six, and we use the term L, so it's hexanel. Remember, I'm gonna go up quickly. Remember I told you here, can you see in this table, I said whenever you have an aldehyde and you got a C double bond, we end off the, the name of that particular compound as an L, so it becomes ethanol. And in this case, in our example, okay, you can see, we have butanoic acid, and this is an aldehyde, so it's hexanel. So you have to know your functional groups in terms of um, labeling your compounds, right? So remember the priority groups, right? So go through these rules when you are labeling your, um, your organic compounds. Then it says, if the same, the, rule number three says, if the same number for the functional group is obtained in both directions, the chain is numbered in the direction that gives the substituent the lowest number, right? So let's look at this example here. You can see I've got one, two, three, four, five carbons, right? So if I'm labeling, if I label from left to right, which means the first one is carbon one, I've highlighted it now. The second carbon is carbon two. Then you're gonna get the OH on the third carbon. And then you're gonna get the two chloros on the fourth carbon. Can you see that? So therefore we say, right? It's not 4,4 dichloro, but I'm gonna start labeling the carbon from the right-hand side. So the first carbon that I've highlighted now will be carbon one. Then you've got the two chloros, that's gonna be carbon two. So hence it is gonna be two comma two. So when you've got two substituents, because it's, we don't just say two dichloro, it's two comma two. That means you've got two chloros on the second carbon. So remember the prefix two comma two di, meaning there's two, chloro groups, right? 2,2 two dichloro. 
and the three all. So the, the hydroxy is sitting on the third carbon in both cases. But notice the chloro beca becomes a lower when we labeling from right to left and not left to right, okay? From right going left. So you can see when I'm going right to left, okay? When I'm going right to left, well, carbon one, carbon two, right? So it's 2,2 two two dichloro and three, right? So it's 2,2 two two dichloro, three, uh, pent three all. So you can say pent three all, okay? Or you can say 2,2 two two dichloro, three pentanol, okay? So there's two ways of labeling this, but stick to one rule of nomenclature where you put 2,2 two dichloro, put the parent compound first, dash the substituent number three and dash all. So it's a pentanol, okay? So this is a pentanol. We don't say three hydroxy because the parent compound takes on the hydroxy group. Remember we said earlier on that halogens do not take on the parent name. It's only written as a substituent, okay? Let's look at the next molecule, right? Now you can see we're trying to find which is the longest carbon chain. So if you see at the bottom, I've labeled it for you, which is the longest chain. And you can see it's got 10 carbons. So whenever you get a chemical organic structure, the first thing that you need to do is identify the longest chain and then look for the substituents attached to that particular chain. Okay, so here you can see you've got basically 10 carbons in this particular uh, chain, right? So if you, if you are labeling now, you can see you got one, two, three. So you got a three methyl, there's a methyl substituent. I highlighted it now, right? There's a methyl substituent. So one, two, three, four, at carbon five, okay, uh, the, the CH3 is missing. There's also a meta, I've highlighted it there, okay? There's also a meta. At carbon six, right, you can see the C, this, you can see the CH2, CH3 at the top, I've highlighted it now. That's a meta, so it's a six, sorry, that's an eta. So you got 3,5 dimethyl. So let's look at the top structure. I'm gonna highlight it now. There's three meta. There's uh, um, five meta, so it's 3,5 dimeta, right? Or you can just say, uh, yeah, 3,5 dimeta. And you can see at position six, you've got an ethyl group. I've just highlighted it for you now. So it's going to be 3,5 dimethyl, six ethyl. Uh, and this case, decane, because it's an, it's an alkane. So the answer to this particular nomenclature, right, is going to be 3,5 dimethyl, showing there's two methyl groups, right? Six ethyl. But now, hang on. Remember what your teacher told you? That if you have the substituents, you've got to put them in alphabetical order. So it's going to be six ethyl ethyl because e is bef before we don't consider the prefix although we're saying dimethyl e is before m so it's going to be six ethyl 3,5 dimethyl decane so when you have two substituents the substituents are labeled in alphabetical order i'm going to go it over again slowly and i'm going to explain the molecule it says Name the following molecule. So I'm gonna look for the longest chain. So there's the first carbon, there's the second carbon, there's the third carbon, there's the fourth carbon, there's the fifth carbon, there's the sixth carbon, there's the seventh carbon, eight carbon, nine carbon, and there's the 10 carbon, right? Now, one, two, three. On carbon three, we've got a meta. And on carbon five, we've got a meta. 
So we're saying it's 3,5 dimethyl, that is one substituent. Then we said that the carbon is 10, 10 carbons long. So your, so your prefix, so let's go on the, on the prefix. Your prefix is 3,5 dimethyl, right? 3,5 dimethyl. The next uh, substituent is on carbon six, and that's an ethyl. So you'll write a six ethyl, 3,5 dimethyl. And then the parent is a decane, okay? So to label this, it's going to be, it's going to be 3,5, right? Three, sorry, it's going to be six dash ethyl, right? Dash 3,5 dash dimethyl, okay? Decane. So can you see how I've labeled this? in terms of the, uh, let me just make it uh, red. Ah, that's better. Right, so you see how I've labeled this as six ethyl because there's the ethyl group, okay? So there's the ethyl group here, right? There's a methyl group here, and there's another, uh, although it's missing here, you can see it on top here. Can you see? There's a methyl. There's another methyl, and this is an ethyl group, right? So when you're labeling, what you do is you write your substituents first. So it's so it's three comma five dimethyl is my first substituent, right? My second substituent is six ethyl, right? And my parent is decade, right? So when I put the three together, that's the, these are the two prefixes, that's the parent compound and you get the name of your compound, okay? So you have to identify the substituents, the longest chain. In Right, so in the previous example, I showed you that here is the OH substituent there, there's the chloro group and there's another chloro group. So we're going to start labeling from there. That's carbon one. This is carbon two. And that's carbon three. So we're doing that so that these two substituents get the lowest number. If we label from this side here, going that way, then the, the hydroxy will be a three, but the two chloros will have been four, four comma four dichloro. So your substituents must take the lowest numbers, okay? So you see that. I'm not too sure if you've done cycloalkanes, right? So we do cycloalkanes. And if you want to label cycloalkanes, then this is simply carbon atoms that are joined in a cyclic group, right? So. With cycloalkanes, like we had uh, with the, the, the straight chain uh, uh, hydrocarbons, we have alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes with cycloalkanes as well, right? That means you can have uh, single bonds like you see in this particular structure here, right? And you can have a double bond and you can have a triple bond. I'm not too sure if you go through uh, cycloalkanes, but you can read the notes on cycloalkanes. And here, is now you can see a double bond in a cycloalkane. Can you see? You've got a double bond. You've got three double bonds in this one here. This molecule has a special name. And this, you obviously must have heard of this compound. It's called benzene, right? You know, benzene is a solvent. And we basically use it as, you remember, they used to fill benzene in lighters, right? It's used to uh, as a solvent but now it's banned because it's carcinogenic, it's cancer causing. So you see, we put a double bond uh, on that, right? Now, these ring structures are, are, are what we refer to as, if you have a conjugated ring structure, we call them, we give them a certain name, that means they are aromatic. But if it's a straight chain hydrocarbon, like you're seeing here, like these here, we call them aliphatic, right? 
you call them aliphatic and aromatic, right? So we just have particular names for these particular compounds. And when we draw the line structure, you can see here's benzene. And here we show because these double bonds can go around from, uh, they, can, they can go from one point to the another. We just show it as a ring structure, okay? So we refer to that. Can you see? So the double bond resonates around. They move from between the two different carbon carbon bonds, right? So you can see here's the structure of benzene, very common uh, uh, aromatic compound we find, right? And here you can see you got five carbons. This is we refer to this as cyclopentane. So whenever you see the term cyclo, it means it's a cyclic compound. You know cyclo, but we don't say we don't say cyclohexane or cyclohexane. Yeah, we, we do say cyclohexane if you have a six carbon compound like the one that I showed you above here, this is cyclohexane. But when you see a double bond like this, we don't call it cyclo, well, possibly you, well, you can call it cyclohexane, but we've given it a special name called benzene, okay? And uh, when you come to study chemistry at the university, we teach you quite a lot of benzene chemistry. And this particular molecule is a starting uh, a starting block for many other uh, uh, chemical reactions to make other compounds, okay? So you can see uh, uh, also in naming uh, compounds, just to give you an idea about naming of cyclo compounds, you can see there's your alcohol group. So you're familiar now. You can see there's an OH group. It's an alcohol group, right? Then you have two chloro groups. So it's a dichloro, right? Can you see somewhere along, you're going to see dichloro. There's a there. And then here we, we refer to this as a, a methoxy, right? A methoxy, right? So whenever you have an O, uh, CH3 like that, it's a methoxy group, right? Now, when you're numbering this compound, it takes the same precedence. Like So you can see this, the parent name is a, cyclohexanol because the alcohol is the main priority group. So this is the priority group, this one here. Now, if we start numbering one, two, three, four, can you see, right? This has become four, right? But if you start numbering from one, let me use a different color. Uh, So if I start one, two, oh, I'm missing this out. One, two, three, and here four, right? So can you see uh, in red, you're going one, two, three. So the methoxy has got a three. But if you if I go from, from uh, in blue, you can see you got three dichloro, right? So your your methoxy group takes the lowest. So your next priority functional group uh, takes priority. That's why we label one, two, sorry. Uh, what am I saying? Let me just, uh, let me just start again. Uh, I've labeled that wrongly. So if I'm starting from there, one in blue, two, three, and there's four, right? You got dichloro, right, in blue. So it's one, two, three, four, dichloro. And if I go in the opposite direction, in red, one, two, three, four, you're also getting the same numbering as far as the uh, substituents are concerned. So in both cases, the dichloro, the methoxy will take the lowest uh, uh, number in terms of three methoxy, right? If I go in blue, one, two, three, uh, one, two, three, four, the methoxy will become a five methoxy. But if I go in red, then one, two, three, can you see? The methoxy has taken a three number, right? So your functional group must take on the lowest number. So you see the methoxy group is here, right? So when I labeled in red, the methoxy is number three. If I labeled in blue, right? The methoxy is actually five here. Yeah. The methoxy becomes five in blue. Can you see that? 
So it's a high number. So we want the functional group to have a low number. Okay. Now let's talk about isomers. Right? Let's talk about isomers. So you must have heard of this term isomer. So you know that isomers are compounds that have the same molecular formula. So you can see the molecular formula is C4H10. So both of these compounds have got four carbons and 10 hydrogens. Count them for me. One, two, three, four. Then I've got H3, H3, that's H6, eight and 10 hydrogens. And here I've got one, two, three, four carbons, three, six, nine, and 10 hydrogens. So both, okay, both of them have the same molecular formula C4, H10, but look at the way that they are arranged. So the arrangement of the atoms are different. And these are called isomers. So these isomers have different properties. Now you can see, obviously one has got a branch and one has got a straight chain. So they have different physical properties. For example, one may have a boiling point that's higher than one that doesn't have a, a, so N-butane may have a higher boiling point than isobutane for reasons that I'll tell you just now, right? So you can see that they will have different properties, physical and chemical properties. So N-butane may be very, very highly flammable. Isobutane may not be so highly flammable. You see, we are, th that's how we're able to look at their properties. So you may have the same molecular formula, but different, a different structural uh, arrangement of the atoms in these two isomers. So we refer to them as isomers. Now, if you did it, but we have what we call constitutional isomers and stereoisomers, right? So if, if, you, if, you, if you've done this, right, the type of isomerism occurs when atoms are connected differently is what we refer to as constitutional isomers, right? So butane and isobutane have a different way of connecting the carbon atoms and are called constitutional isomers. Can you see here? The way that they are arranged are constitutional isomers, right? For example, if we have a molecular formula of C2H6O, how many ways can we connect the atoms together? And you can see we can connect them in two different ways but one is ethanol and one is dimethyl ether. And these are two totally different types of compounds, right? So can you see how when you have constitutional isomers, that means the way we put that, the, so one is an ether, you can see the R, O, R, okay? So you can see that it's, its formula is R and there's O and R, right? And in both, in, in one case, the R is CH3 on one side, and in the other case, it's CH3 on the other side. This is an alcohol. So here you have basically CH3, CH2OH, right? And there's the, the formula is written there CH3, CH2OH. So you got one carbon attached to three hydrogens, the middle carbon attached to two, and you got an OH at the end, right? So the presence of unsaturation in a molecule also introduces the possibility of isomerism. And this is just an extension of the idea of functional groups having different positions. So if you have an alkene, then you can also have the, uh, the different positions. Can you see that your alkene is between carbon two and carbon three in one case? Can you see that? There's your double bond there between carbon two and three, right? But now you got the same, it's exactly the same molecular formula, but see where's your double bond between carbon one and carbon two, okay? So the two molecules would therefore be two butene. Can you see two butene? The in is between carbon at carbon two 
And in this case, it's going to be but one in, right? So but two in and but one in. In is telling you that it's an alkene. One is telling you the position of the double bond. And but is telling you that it's got four carbons, one, two, three, four. So you can have isomers uh, of these two different compounds, right? Then we have what we call stereoisomers, right? Stereoisomers. I'm going to uh, 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 look at, just show you uh, some, if, if you've done stereoisomers, then go through your notes and, and at the next, at the next uh, uh, session, I'll go through uh, conformational, maybe just by a, a show. Have you guys done stereoisomers? Can you please uh, uh, mute yourself, those that have logged in? Can 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 any one of the, the the students tell me if you've done stereo, uh, if you've done stereo isomers uh, in your in your organic chemistry or conformational uh, is So, for example, if I show you uh, these structures, are you familiar with stereo isomers? No. No, you've done Sisson. Have you done Sisson trans isomers? Oh, who's, can somebody who's please mute yourself? Thank you. So if I asked you, have you heard of cis and trans isomers? Have you heard of cis and trans isomers? You can just give me a thumbs up if you've heard of it. If you're not, give me a thumbs down. Have you done cis and trans? So you can, in your chat box, you can say, yes, if you've done cis and trans, or no, you haven't. You can just type your answer in the chat box. Have you done cis and trans isomerism in your organic chemistry section? Yes or no? No, okay, all right. Then it, the notes are here. So if you find that you have a question on cis and trans uh, isomers, so here, and cis and trans isomers, you find them with alkenes, right? With alkenes. So if you find that you've done it, you can simply go through the, the, the notes on cis and trans and it explains it here, what are cis and trans isomers, et cetera. Okay, right. Now, I want to start a reaction uh, uh, mechanisms or reactions of organic chemistry, right? So I'm just going to go through some of the familiar ones and explain to you how to understand organic reactions, right? And so you'll see it's written here on the notes, organic chemistry is largely about making new carbon containing compounds, right? So one of the most uh, common uh, compounds that we make using organic chemistry is guess what? Polymers, right? Plastics, you know, your paints, your paints contain resins. These are all made up of, of organic compounds, right? So if you think about the pharmaceutical industry, uh, we use a lot of organic reactions to produce a lot of antibiotics, right? Antiviral reagents, antibacterial, you saw with COVID, uh, all of that. Then uh, with organic chemistry, we also make, um, uh, you produce like, uh, uh, you know, uh, plastic materials or you produce uh, new materials, um, solvents, et cetera, et cetera, new organic uh, chemicals from organic ke chemical reactions, right? So I'll give you an example at, at Cecil, at Sasol in, in Secunda. Now what they do is they take, uh, <clears throat> they basically carry out a, a process where they take, um, um, uh, you would find that they, uh, that they would take uh, uh, carbon and they heat the carbon and they basically uh, produce from carbon monoxide, they produce uh, 
um, ethylene units, and then the ethylene units gets polymerized to form polyethylene, and uh, they form from one of them they form octane. Then um, they polymerize the the uh, ethylene units and they form uh, paraffins and waxes. There's over 140 different products that comes out of or due to organic chemical reactions. Okay. So organic chemistry is very, very fascinating. So in the lab, you can start off with one compound and you can react it, you can, you can catalyze it, and you can make many, many other uh, compounds. So for example, if you take alcohol and you can oxidize it with the, uh, you know, uh, by heating it with an oxidizing agent, you would make um, a carboxylic acids, okay? So you can see, you can make uh, different compounds using these chemical reactions, right? So what are mechanisms? I, I'm not gonna pay too much attention on the mechanisms, but I'm gonna show you, uh, for example, a free radical halogenation of alkenes to form alkyl halides. Then um, what we mean by electrophilic addition reactions of alkenes. So I'm gonna look at, uh, at reactions of alkanes, right? Reactions of alkanes. They undergo a, a, a um, halogenation reactions. Then I'm gonna look at the reactions of alkenes. How do alkenes react? Then we'll look at um, how you can react alkenes to form aldehydes and ketones. And oxidation reactions. What do oxidation and reduction reactions mean? Okay, how do we make alkenes, right? And then something called uh, nucleophilic substitution reactions. But I'm gonna choose some very simple reactions and show you some easy reactions that you've come across in your notes, right? These are just the topics that you can see your organic components go through quite a lot of detailed reactions. And I'm sure in your notes, you have come across some of these like, uh, now, you know, alkanes are very difficult to react to, alkanes. They're the most difficult. So we've got to now do something to the alkanes for them to react. Alkenes are a little bit, little bit more reactive because they've got a double bond, so you can still stick things onto the double bond. And alkynes, right? Even your al aldehydes, ketones, the you know, wherever you see those functional groups, the, those organic com components are reactive, okay? Then I'm sure you must have heard about this word mechanism, right? Mechanism. So a mechanism is basically shows you exactly how a reaction takes place. So you remember, um, um, I, I told you if you had like a, a CH4 and you remove one hydrogen and you put an OH onto it, right? So remember we had, if you had a carbon, right? And we had a hydrogen, right here. And then you had another hydrogen, another hydrogen, and another hydrogen uh, attached to your carbon like that. Okay, so you had, so you had your four hydrogens. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to simply re react, react. We will remove that OH, and then that is going to form now an OH like that. So we put in an OH, right? So you see what you got to do is you first got to take out this hydrogen. Then you got to put in an O and then you got to put back the hydrogen onto it like that. Okay. So we don't do it one atom at a time, but there's mechanisms. So a mechanism attempts to show how we did that. How did we take out this hydrogen first, put an oxygen, and put the H, or didn't we just put on an OH? Where did we get this OH from, right? So you think about it, hey, if I got Na, right, plus, okay, and if I've got OH from sodium hydroxide, hey, there's sodium hydroxide here, right? There's sodium hydroxide. But first I need to get this H out. I need to get this H out. And then if I add sodium hydroxide, I'm sure the OH will go and stick on like that. You see that? I'm just giving an example of that. So the mechanism now is telling you exactly how we remove that H, then we took NaOH, 
we added water to it and it broke down into Na plus and OH. And then the OH attacked it and we show these arrows like that. So we call that a mechanism, right? That's what a mechanism shows exactly how the reaction has taken place. Okay. So don't worry too much about free radical electrophilic elimination. As I said, I'm going to show you how those reactions take place. Now, you know, for example, when, when you want to react something, you got to either first break a bond and then you got to form a bond, right? So now you, I told you that carbon has got four bonds and it's very difficult to break that carbon hydrogen bond. You know, the one I showed you here, there. To break that carbon hydrogen bond is a curse, right? It's not easy to do that. So when a single covalent bond breaks, you know what's a covalent bond? That means, can you see here, they're sharing. Can you see they're sharing an electron pair? So there's one electron there and another electron there. So this XY bond is sharing an electron pair. Can you see that? Right. So when a single covalent bond breaks, two different outcomes are possible. One way is for the two electrons in the bond to divide equally. And this is known as homolytic fission and results in the formation of free radicals, like what you're showing here now, right? So you form these free radicals. Whenever you see the word free radicals, you must know these, these things are very, very, very unstable. That means they want to go and bond with something else or maybe bond with each other again, right? So each of X and Y now has an odd electron by the dot. So we're seeing a dot, right? So that is homolytic fission, right? So this is bond breaking that's, that's, uh, that's uh, forming, right? And that's what happens. So can you see, for instance, what has happened here with C2H6, right? I've now taken C2H6, and generally how we do that is we heat it, right? When we heat it, you can see it's formed, it's broken up because you have, you have, you have something like this. You have a CH3 and a dash and a CH3, right? So can you see what we've done now? We've broken the bond there in the center there. And because you have two electrons like that, okay, you have two electrons like that, then you've got CH3 with one dot and you broke it. So you've got two CH3, we call these methyl radicals, okay? So, and there's a showing it how it happened here. Okay, I didn't have to show all that. Right, so the other way to break a bond is basically where both the electron pairs, right? Let me put an electron pair there. Can you see what has happened? This electron pair now went only to the Y, to, to the Y side of the molecule. Now look at this reaction here. See the CH3, 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 CCL, right? We call this an alkyl halide, right? So, Let's label, let's, let's give it a name, right? So if you start numbering, that's gonna be one, that's going to be two, and that's going to be three. So it's a propyl, so it's a two methyl, right? Propyl, so in this case, it's a two, it can be a two chloro, two methyl, propyl, right? Or propane, basically, right? So it's two methyl, two chloro, propane. Now, what has happened is that the lone pair went only to the chlorine atom. So this chlorine atom looks like this. It's got the chlorine atom and it's got with it the two electron pairs like that. Right? Now this is, but this carbon now, because the electron bond or the bond pair moved away, it becomes positive and we call this a carbocation, right? So you can see, um, and here we have a chloro, a chloride or an anion, 
right? Can you see the positive and negative charge, how it's? And generally, you've, so carbocations is what we formed, right? So again, we're saying that if we break a bond, we can form where they share the electrons equally, like what I showed you here, right? Like what I showed you there, they shade one electron, or in another case, the one becomes greedy and the electron moves, only the electron pair moves to one of the atoms exclusively. And that becomes now a separation of charge. Can you see that? Positive carbocation and a negative anion. So you can have a carbocation, and this is what we call a carb anion, right? So this is the carb anion, right? So we're coming from the word anion, meaning negative, and cation, carbocation, meaning positive there, right? Carb anion, carbocation, okay? So now, what we know about, right, so now let's talk about, don't worry about uh, stability of carbocations for now. Let's talk about bond formation. To form a single bond, we need two electrons. This can also happen in two ways. So you remember when we broke them? So the two single electrons can come again and form a bond. The radicals, these are two radicals, two rascal radicals. They're reactive, they're naughty. Or the carb anion, the carboanion is looking for a, remember electrons only move, not protons. So these two electrons here, right? they will now look for a positive charge to form a bond. And that's how they form the bond. So like we saw bond breaking, we have bond formation, okay? So you can see here now, if you have a C, so if you started off with a CH4 and you removed, remember I showed you earlier on that alkyl halide in that table? So if we removed a chloro, right? So if I had, like that, like that, like that, like that. And can you see this H is here, right? Now I moved it, right? So by some reason, what has happened? The, it moved and can you see I formed a positive charge there? And now I've got chloride ions and that chloride ion goes and attacks there. That's the mechanism I'm showing you, see? We draw the mechanism and now we form the bond. And this is what we call methyl chloride or methylene chloride, right? Methylene chloride. And this is a solvent, by the way, right? So when something likes a nucleus, when a, a, a carb anion, see this here, it likes the nucleus, we call it nucleophilic. Philic means affinity too, right? So the chloride is termed a nucleophile and the carbocation is termed an electrophile. So this likes electrons, it's called an electrophile. This likes carbocations, it's called a nucleophile because it likes the nucleus, okay? It likes the nucleus. Can you please mute your- Listen, we have a whole lot of clubs to the slightly orchestrated the protest. If, oh my gosh. Come on, guys, when you're logging on, please uh, uh, mute yourself when you're logging on, okay? So now let's look at the generation of free radicals, right? And how we generate free radicals. So if you've got a chlorine molecule, H nu stands for light. That just stands for E is equal to H nu. You remember from properties of light, it simply means we irradiating something with light. So when you take chlorine and you irradiate it to light, you will form these radicals, these chloride, these chlorine radicals. Now, can you see you've got methane, methane, right? So what has happened is a chlorine radical abstracts a hydrogen atom. Can you see what has happened here, right? So if you, are, if you are now subject the methane to a chlorine radical, then you pull, out, you pull out one of the hydrogens and you form a hydrogen radical. Can you see that? 
So the hydrogen radical and the CLH form a bond. Now you form the CH3 radical. And can you see what has happened here now? The chlorine and the chlorine splits again. And then the CH3 radical looks for a chlorine radical. And here it formed the product that we're looking for. So chloromethane is formed and the other, another chlorine radical is now produced. So we can have to deal with this here. So you can see, because you have another chlorine radical, they would now form a chlorine or it'll form a CHCl3 and a 2CH3. So these are all the termination. So a free radical substitution to stop free radicals must react with each other, right? So to stop this, right, we have what we call chain termination steps, which means once you have free chlorine, you can simply add more chlorine to it, or you can add more CH3 to it uh, to stop these reactions, okay? Now, remember I said electrophilic addition to an alkene, electrophilic meaning electrophile, electron loving, right? So now let's look at what's going to happen in reactions with alkenes, right? We're looking at addition to an alkene. So here's the alkene and here's a reagent, right? So for example, H, C, L. Now the H can go there and the Cl can go there. So can you see I've added the H to that bond and uh, to that carbon and the Cl to that carbon. So this is now, we refer to it as an electrophilic addition. Remember I said electrophile is electron loving. What's an electrophile? Electron loving, right? Which means if the H is plus and the Cl is minus, that means something is going to attach to this H plus. And then you're gonna have, right? Electrophilic addition. That means an electrophile is electron loving, right? The H plus is going to be electron loving. Can you see that? It's an electrophile, right? So, Let's take another reaction, yeah. Can you see? It's showing you a reaction of an alkene. This is ethene. So this electron pair here is now electron loving. That means it's going to the H plus. This H plus is an electrophile because it likes the two electrons sitting in this bond. And then the Br gets chased away. So can you see what has happened here? that H has attacked onto that carbon, and then the Br now will become a nucleophile because it likes the plus there. And can you see, there's it there, and you form now this CH3, CH2 Br, you formed an alkyl halide. See, so you put the Br there. Can you see here? There's your Br here and it forms an alkyl halide. So we started with a double bond, and now we finished off with a saturated. So each carbon has got one, two, three, four bonds, one, two, three, four bonds. So it's an alkyl halide because we put a halide across the double bond there. We put a hydrogen there, and we put the bromine on this side, like you can see. So you've now formed an alkyl halide, okay? So do you see how you need to look at reactions, right? So I've only showed you now the alkanes and the alkenes. I'm going to show you more alkenes at my next lecture. So please go through the reactions and write them down. And if your teacher did mechanisms, you will, they will have taught you these mechanisms that you are learning here. 
and you have to know how these reactions take place which part of the re like like you can see here now if you've got hbr where is the h going to attack and where the br and how they're going now always remember h is plus and br is going to be minus because it's a halogen it's a negative if you had hcl as well so remember if you had hcl right the h is plus the cl is minus remember hcl is hydrochloric acid even if you had hi right hi so h is plus the I is minus, okay? So you see a similar pattern and a similar trend with this uh, reactions across the double bond, okay? So organic chemistry is very easy. It's not difficult, but you have to understand how these reactions are taking place, okay? So I will explain to you how a free radical reaction takes place with alkanes. Now I've explained how halogenation reactions, right? Electrophilic reactions take place to an alkene. And there's this word we use, Makovnikov and anti-Makovnikov addition, right? So we're going to learn about Makovnikov and anti-Makovnikov additions to alkenes. So what does... Makovnikov's rule say, right? What does Makovnikov's rule say, right? When an unsymmetric reagent has a dipole, is added to an unsymmetric alkene, the delta positive portion always, uh, the delta positive portion of the reagent always adds to the carbon of the alkene with the most number of hydrogen atoms attached to it, okay? Uh, let me show you that reaction. Okay, it's not here. So if you have an alkene like this with a double bond, and if I have an H here like that, right? And on this side, if I have CH3, like that. And if on this carbon, I've got CH2, like that. And if I've got CH3, like that, right? And if I'm adding HCl, like that. So HCl is an unsymmetric, now there's a dipole here, meaning that's plus and that's negative. So you can see the dipole, right? So remember we said there's electron density around the chlorine atom, but all you've got to remember is that the delta positive, so whenever you see HCl or HBr, remember if it's a halogen, it's gonna be delta negative. And if it's H plus, it's going to be delta positive. Right? And it says, Makovnikov's rule says, when an unsymmetric reagent, so you can see the reagent is HCl, it's unsymmetric because it's got a delta positive and delta negative. That means it's got a dipole moment. Is added to an unsymmetrical alkene. You can see there's the alkene that is unsymmetrical. The delta positive portion of the reagent adds to the carbon of the alkene with the most number of hydrogens attached to it. So you see this, you see this, this part of the, 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 the hydrogen now, the delta positive is going to add here, right? And the chlorine is going to add there, okay? That's what Makovnikov's rule states, okay? So that is Makovnikov's rule, if you've come across it, right? So learn Makovnikov's rule, right? Now I'm going to go through some of the, uh, let me see if I can go through the reactions. If 
fuck, what's this isomers? Oh, an elimination reaction. Okay. Uh, let me just talk about substitution reactions and tell you what's a substitution reaction, right? So that you'll understand it. Right, so then we have what we call nucleophilic substitution. And if you, if you heard of SN1 substitution, and one stands for unimolecular, and SN substitution, and two means bimolecular, meaning there's two, there's two uh, uh, reagents involved, okay? So this type of reaction is known as a substitution reaction, right? As the halogen atom, right? So if you see here, the halogen atom is merely being replaced by another group and the hybridization state and the molecular geometry of the affected carbon does not change. So if you look here, okay, your chlorine has left. Can you see? This is the leaving group and the OH has now added, right? But so we've simply substituted the OH for the Cl group. The stereochemistry has not changed. It stays the same, right? So the geometry of this hasn't. So this is basically called a substitution reaction, right? And you can see now in this case, it's only, so if it's only one reactant is involved in the formation of the reaction intermediate, we call this an SN1, right? And if there are two, we refer to it as SN2. So S stands for substitution. N means nucleophilic attack. You can see the OH is attacking the nucleophile, right? So, and one means only one reactant is involved. Can you see? There's only the OH, only one reactant. So this is an SN1 reaction, okay? So you can see the substrate and that refers to a substitution reaction. Okay. Now, how do SN1 reactions occur? Uh, you can see in this case, the Cl is the leaving group, the halogen. So that's why we're saying here, the X left and you produced a carbocation, right? And then you can see this is a nucleophile. Remember here we said the OH minus, the OH minus is a nucleophile. That means nucleus loving. It's looking for the nucleus there. And then it forms this here. Right. So an example of an SN1 is what I showed you here with the OH. So there's the CR leaves. The OH attacks. There's only one reactant. And it forms, the, it forms an alcohol as a product. So all sub SN1 reactions go via a carbocation intermediate. So this is the carbocation intermediate that we find here. So these are referred to as SN1 reactions, okay? I'm not going to do SN2 reactions because it'll be quite easy if you have done, I don't think you've done SN2 reactions, right? Uh, but if you, if you uh, I've got the notes on SN2 reactions to show you how SN2 reactions take place, okay? And I think I'll stop there for today. And at my next lecture, I'm going to do elimination reactions. And I'm going to show you how elimination reactions from an alkyl halide goes to an alkene. So I want you to understand these different types of reactions, the mechanisms, and what type of products we form as far as this is concerned. So take your organic notes, take the specific reaction and fit it in, whether it's an elimination reaction, whether it's a substitution reaction, whether it's a Markovnikov reaction and write out, excuse me, write out the notes on what type of reactions you are going through, okay? So please make sure that you are uh, able to look at how these reactions. So you can see in this elimination reaction, right? We eliminating HBr, right? And what you form? You formed an alkene. 
So from an alkyl halide, you form an alkene, right? And if you add H, so going the opposite direction now, right? So if you simply add HBr, right? HBr, right? Is going to be a Markovnikov addition. Can you see? So the H is going to go to the side with the most number of hydrogens and the Br is going to go there. So it's a, it's going to be a nucleophilic addition, but it's a Markovnikov addition. You see? So your reactions are simple, but it can be classified in a different way. So an elimination reaction from an alkane to an alkene, uh, sorry, an alkyl halide to an alkene, or an unsymmetrical addition of, uh, of a nucleophilic addition to an alkene to give you an alkyl halide. Just the terms sound a bit, a bit complicated, but they're not. They're quite straightforward. So elimination reactions, as you can see, and you got an elimination reaction of an alkyl halide to give you an alkene. And then you can have a Markovnikov addition of an unsymmetrical uh, alkyl, uh, an unsymmetrical reagent like HBr to go back to the alkyl halide. Okay. So I will discuss this and I'll go through the mechanisms of this and show you this as well. So I'll discuss after this elimination reactions, uh, I'll go through all the organic reactions with you, but I wanted to show you what, an, what a mechanism means, right? What mechanism means. And then, so you saw what substitution, then I'll discuss elimination mechanisms and I'll show you how the elimination mechanisms, E1 mechanisms and E2 mechanisms. And we'll talk a little bit about Satev's rules, something called Satev's rules, okay? So next week is an important week because I'm going to go through all your organic reactions, right? So you can use my notes and you can go through the organic reactions, right? So I'll stop there for today. And uh, at my next lecture, you've got to come and listen to the elimination reactions and the um, Satev's rule and the uh, organic reactions. So I'll go through all the organic reactions with you. So in your exams, if you get any organic reactions, I'll show you how to work out the products. It'll be quite straightforward. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to say thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, Dr. Possessor. Okay, cheers. Part of the UK that in experience is the opportunity to be part of a community and to network with not only our world-renowned academics, but with future game changers and leaders. They do say that the extent of one's success can be attributed to those they rub shoulders with. Therefore, you must surround yourself with like-minded people. So, how do you become part of a community that is committed to your self-development? How do you become part of UK ZN? First, you have to apply. All applications for undergraduate studies at UKZN are processed through the Central Applications Office, CAO. This is for both your course and student residence application. The application process is as follows. Step 1. Consult the CAO Handbook. This handbook provides a list of all qualifications available at UKZN. Step 2. Have a look through the various courses offered and choose a program that interests you and for which you meet the minimum requirements. As one of the top five universities in the country, UKZN promotes academic excellence. So meeting the minimum requirements does not guarantee you a place to study. Step three, find the program code linked to your chosen qualification. This is the code you need to enter in your application form. Okay, let me show you something. You see, a code has three parts. Example, for BCom in accounting, the code is KN-P-BCN. 
O K N W B C N. Crazy code, right? Well, basically, the K N stands for UKZN, the middle part stands for the campus of your choice P for Peter Maritzburg, W for Wistful. Then, BCN stands for the actual course. Make sure to get these codes right. Step 4. Use this program code when completing your CAO form, which is available from the CAO website. Your application will be sent to UKZN. You can always check the status of your application using your CAO number, ID number or passport number on this website www.caocheck.ukzn.ac.za For more information, visit www.cao.ac.za It's that easy. Pay close attention to closing dates for qualifications. For example, MBCHB closes on the 30th of June, whilst other undergraduate programs close on the 30th of September. What are you waiting for? Apply now and shape your future today.